Welcome to another edition of Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm Anthony T. In this edition, I will be talking to actress slash producer slash casting director Maria Olsen. As I'll talk to her about her career, plus her latest short film, She Burns in Hell, which is a Carrie fan film that can be found on Concept Media's YouTube channel. Plus, I may have a question or two, a sequel to a cult classic, which I'm not telling you, you're going to have to listen to the interview, as I want it to be a surprise to those who haven't found out already about this sequel to a cult classic. And I managed to chat with her a very tiny bit about it so definitely stick around for the interview because this is I think one of my best interviews period I am not saying it hyperbole or I'm patting myself on the back this was really I think one of my favorite interviews I've done so far and I can't wait for you to check it out plus right after the news I'll talk about women in horror as this is Women in Horror Month here on Anthony T's Horror Show. As you may notice, all the guests this month will feature various women in horror. I'll talk more about women in horror in my commentary piece right after the news. Then later on in the show, you'll get my review of Happy Death Day to You, which recently came out. In theaters, and this is pretty much, I think, the first major horror release of the year. As I'm not counting The Prodigy because, well, that film really does not scream box office numbers. So, this will be my first major horror re review of the year. As I'll be doing mo more reviews here on the show, as I figured, why not put my blogger expertise and give you some reviews as well of current horror films and since I have a showcase subscribe subscription it works out well then at the end I'll recommend another film directed by a woman and I'm gonna go way back with this one think more of the lines of the 70s way before women in a horror movement started as I'm going to recommend a film from that period it's a very good film I'll give you a hint it's a vinegar syndrome title so I will talk about this film and why you should see this film but first I have a little business to attend to called the news first off Scream Factory recently announced that they will be doing a collector's edition of Night of the Creeps now, this is the Fred Decker film from the late 80s. You may know him from Monster Squad, in which he directed. And it's definitely a very fun film. I love this film a lot. Plus, it has one of my favorite horror characters of all time in Detective Ray Cameron. And if the release of Night of the Demons on Blu-ray isn't enough. It will also have a special package edition that will include, I believe, two slip covers. And, and this is the big seller for yours truly, an action figure of Detective Ray Cameron. This is definitely worth picking up. The action figure is even endorsed by Tom Atkins himself, which is a huge plus to go along with the fact that we're getting an action figure of Tom Atkins. Finally. And there's only one thing to say about this. Throw me! Have to throw it in there every time I talk about Night of the Creeps. Sorry. That's just the, one of the single greatest lines in the history of horror. Throw me. Tom Atkins is definitely the man. It's usually... One of the few times where I'll just go all fanboy. Because I just love that character in that line. But enough with that. Let's get back to the news. 
before we get off track here. Now, this is actually one of the few times, if not the only time, that I will ever mention Disney here on Anthony T's Horror Show. But it's with good intentions because Disney is planning on looking to either do a sequel or a live action film to The Nightmare Before Christmas. Bloody Disgusting recently posted an article on it on their website. And the thing is, they are looking to either do a sequel to The Nightmare Before Christmas or a live action film. I don't know if a live action film would work with that film. So I'm really hoping it's a sequel. I don't want a reboot. Because there's essentially no need to reboot The Nightmare Before Christmas. But I kind of want to see a sequel. It would be interesting to see where they go with it. If they go with the sequel route. Personally, I'm hoping they just do a sequel to it. If I'm going to get a new Nightmare Before Christmas movie, it's better off to have the sequel get Chris Sarandon back as Jack Skellington and have a new story. I really do not want to see a live action film. I know they are starting to do this with most of their properties but I really truly believe The Nightmare Before Christmas wouldn't work as a live action film because it probably obviously would rely heavily on CGI because I just don't see actors being playing the role of these characters plus I just don't want to see something that really may look like a cash grab. But I'm hoping hoping these talks are true, the story's true, and they will be doing a sequel to the original, as I would be down for it. Greystone Entertainment recently announced that they will be doing a sequel to 1031 called 1031 2. This has got a good lineup of directors so far, including Drew Mavic, who directed Pooh Pie Massacre and also was a past guest on the show. You also got Tristan Clay, who directed Red Eye, which is a very good film that you should check out. Now you got a couple of people I'm not familiar with. Tori Van Buskirk, who directed a film called Come to Me, Sister Mary. And Stephen Wolf, who directed Dracula's Coffin. The only cast members announced so far for the upcoming sequel are Tamara Glenn, who is in Halloween 5 Revenge of Michael Myers, and Alvolia, Queen of Screams. This lineup looks like it's going to be a very good film. I cannot wait for 1031 2 to come out. There's, there's no release date yet, but I'm hoping for this year. And finally, in news, Orion Pictures recently released the teaser trailer for the new Child's Play film that is due to come out in June. Well, I would talk about it, but it is something that really irks me, and it really brings what I think this film is going to be. So... Instead of just talking about it now, I made a little comment on my on the show's official Facebook page. You'll get my full thoughts about this on a March episode. Because I'm not going to take away from Women in Horror Month just to go on another long-winded rant on the Child's Play remake. Because this is becoming a fixture on the show. And it's not a good thing. Because this is one of those films that's really irked me from the beginning. I'll go more into this on an episode next month. Like I said, I don't want to take away from Women in Horror Month. But you can expect a rant on this. Because really, it's like it's my worst 
fears about this film might be coming true. And that's the news. Have a podcast that you want to promote? Well, if you're interested in swapping commercials, you can promote your show here on Anthony T's Horror Show. And in return, I will promote your commercial on my show as well. For more information, contact me at anthonytshorrorshow at gmail.com. Warning, the following commentary doesn't represent the views of Doc Discussions or the Doc Discussions Network. In other words, there are my views, my views only. Now, I wanted to get to this last episode, but with the whole Amazon indie film purge controversy, I felt like it needed a segment. But I wanted to talk about Women in Horror Month. As it's going on right now in the month of February. This is usually the month where it celebrates women in horror. Whether it's actresses or directors or producers or writers. It's a celebration of women working in the horror genre. I cannot stress this enough. I really feel like there needs to be more vo- female voices in horror. Especially directing and writing sides of it. Because you've got some really good women directors like the Saska sisters. Jessica Cameron. Joe Gavazian. And others out there. But what disturbs me is that mainstream Hollywood doesn't even consider them when it comes to horror films. Very rarely you see it. Maybe like Mary Lambert directing the original Pet Cemetery, and Mary Heron with American Psycho. I know there's a couple others I probably forgot. I wish the studios would give women a chance in directing horror films because I'm interested in seeing horror films directed. By women. It's nice to get a different perspective. On the horror genre. You don't see that from the major studios. Which really makes me sad. Because I really think the Saska sisters. Quite frankly should be directing a major studio horror film by now. They have really are talented. Whether it's comic book writing. Or films they should be directing a studio film but they're not i don't get it and there should be more inclusiveness of women in horror because i'm interested to see hearing or reading their perspective on things i'm sick of people who really don't want to realize I support women in horror, whether it's a director, a producer, a writer, an actor, a special effects artist. I support it all, whether it's films, podcasts, or journalists. This is something that people should accept because the horror genre is for everyone. It's not an all guys club. And the way the major studios treat it, it feels that way when it comes to horror. Because I don't see female directors do big budget horror films or horror films that make it to the big screen. You don't see that. I don't know why these Hollywood suits don't let women direct horror films. As they can really bring a nice and unique voice to the horror genre while giving you entertainment and an interesting story. But these people in Hollywood don't seem to do that. And it really bugs me. 
that you don't see more women directing in horror. Because they should. And another topic that I want to bring up that also pertains to this discussion is the stupid trolling. I hate it when you're just trolling female podcasters, female on various boards. It's sick. That stuff needs to stop. Because the horror genre is for everyone. It's for us men and for women as well. So when you're on a horror board and they have an opinion, please treat them with respect. Not trolling them or, or using sexism. Because that kind of stuff really makes me sick. And it really hurts the genre that we all love because women have a right to have a voice in the horror genre and sometimes it really sickens me that people whether in Hollywood or the average person on a group ignores them or is trolling them this stuff has to stop this is why I'm supporting Women in Horror Month this month here on Anthony T's Horror Show. Hey guys, this is Steven Christina. I'm the founder, owner, creator, and host of Super Retro Throwback Reviews. Are you looking for the best movie reviews, music reviews, video game reviews, and Comic-Con coverage all around? Well then look no further. Definitely check out Super Retro Throwback Reviews on YouTube and our new audio podcast, the new and improved Super Retro Throwback Reviews Audio Files version 2.0 on the following media distributors. Podbean, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. Class is over, John. Time for something new and improved. Welcome back to Anthony T's Horror Show. I'm here with actress slash producer slash casting director Maria Olson, as we're going to talk about some of her films. In her latest short film, She Burns in Hell, a Carrie fan film, which was recently done by Conceptual Media. Excuse me, concept media films. Welcome to the show, Maria. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you for having me today. You're welcome. Now, first question, what made you want to get into acting? Um, I've been performing since I was six years old. Um, that's when I started theater. Um, I started dance classes, and we had annual shows. So I literally grew up in the theater, and by about um, late primary school or high school, I started doing plays and musicals, and my love for acting just grew out of that. And I am, to this day, extremely comfortable on stage and also in front of a camera because I just have been doing that for my entire life. Now, with the over 200 credits on IMDb, you've worked on a wide range of films, from big studio films like Percy Jackson to small films like Trophy Heads. What are some of the differences that you've seen on big budget films and indie films in terms of atmosphere and energy on set? I think I prefer the energy on the smaller sets. Everyone gets to know everyone else, and if you're there for a longest shoot, then it becomes almost like a family. Um, on the big sets, everyone's super professional, um, but they're also a bit distant, and you never ever even get to meet some people in departments that you're not involved with, you know? Um, on the Percy Jackson set, for instance, um, if I had downtime, I would be escorted to my trailer by the second second AD and I would just sit in my trailer for hours and not interact with anyone else. Um, but on the smaller sets, if I have downtime, well, I can sit and speak to other people, I can maybe even watch shooting, I can maybe even assist shooting if the set is small enough. So it's more of a collaborative, friendly, encompassing family feel on the smaller films and I actually enjoy that even though of course the big films are absolutely wonderful to work on too. 
Now, one of the major studio films that you were in was Paranormal Activity 3. You get that role as one of the creepy ladies in the film. Well, um, I had done several casting workshops with um, amazing casting directors who work out of Los Angeles. And the casting director, um, Tina Becker on Paranormal Activity 3, remembered me when it came time to cast those creepy coven women in PA3. And she tracked down my representative, my agent or manager at the time, who contacted me and said, you need to come in for this. Um, so I auditioned for it. I did not know what I was auditioning for um, because the film was being shot under another name. It was called uh, Sports Camp. Um, often uh, very um, anticipated films will shoot under another name so as not to like, you know, let the cat out of the bag. Um, and I went in there, I did my thing, I signed a non-disclosure agreement before I even started auditioning. Um, I did what they asked of me and went home. And a couple days later they told me that I booked it. So I went to set, met up with a whole bunch of other creepy ladies and we shot our scenes. Um, it took one night, actually, for us to shoot that, still not knowing what we were working on. And it was only like two or three weeks later um, that one of my friends contacted me and she was like, oh my gosh, do you understand? We just worked on Paranormal Activity 3. And I was like, oh, how wonderful is that? So that was a very interesting and strange little story. Now, were you shocked that... You were working on Paranormal Activity 3 after the fact? I was, yes. Um, I thought it was just another random horror movie called Sports Camp. I mean, it's possible, you know. Um, but then it was a really awesome surprise to learn that I had just become part of, like, one of the most popular horror franchises of all time. And that was super, super cool. And I'm very proud of it. Now, what was it like working on set on that film? It was just like any other horror movie, actually. You know, there wasn't anything special, super special about it that even gave us an indication that we were working on a, on a film of that size. Um, we just shot one night at the house in um, Altadena, I believe it was, just outside of Los Angeles. And it was just a normal set. Um... We had been sitting around for some hours, and I, I was hungry. It was like 2 a.m., and I went to Crafty to get something to eat, and I got a whole bunch of jelly beans just to give me that sugar rush. And the minute I had them in my hand, they were like, all right, you guys, come to set. We're shooting this. And I'm like, okay, I will just put these jelly beans uh, in my jacket pocket. So I shot my entire scene as creepy lady, whatever, with jelly beans in my pocket, and I, like, snacked in between takes. <laughs> Yeah. Now, you got to work with Ariel Schultzman and Henry Jones yes. on the film. What was it like working with both of those directors? They were great. Um, I remember them as being young and full of enthusiasm and, and just love for the project that they were working on. Um, and if I remember correctly, they are both um, Dutch, of Dutch descent, or from um, Holland, and I am as well. So that was really a nice, like, oh, look what we have in common point. Um, I really enjoyed that shoot. It was relaxed and fun and interesting, you know, just really fun. Now, what was the makeup process like for your character? For uh, Paranormal Activity 3? Yeah. Didn't have any special makeup on. Um, maybe they just, you know, put a couple powder, layers of powder or whatever on so that we didn't, like, look extremely shiny. But it was very realistic, nothing special. You know, maybe ten minutes in the makeup chair, tops. Now, a no another notable film that you've been in is Stereo. Yes. As the casting director. Yes. How did that role come about? Well, I had auditioned for a short film called Curtain. Um, auditioned before Dennis Whitmire and Kevin Kalsch of Parallactic Pictures. And they had booked me to play the succubus in their short film Curtain. And we shot that and had a wonderful time. The film got a great... Um, uh, everyone loves the film. 
everyone who sees it loves it. It's up on their website, etc., etc., won awards. So when they wrote their next short film, which was Starry Eyes, they were like, hey, there's a small role for you. And I'm like, dudes, I'm there. Count me out. Count, count, count me in. <laughs> and then over time, the short film Starry Eyes became this feature film Starry Eyes. But I was always attached as the casting director because I had worked with them on Curtain. So when it came time to to shoot it, when they, after they got um, assistance with the funding and they were going through the whole casting process and that, um, Dennis was like, yes, absolutely, you're still on board. We had a meeting, we discussed the character, and then we went into the shoot. So I didn't even have to audition for that. I just knew them, and they just attached me at the time it was a short film. I mean, that is like so lucky, it's ridiculous, because Starry Eyes, I think, is a great film, and I'm so proud to be a part of that one. Now, speaking of the director's... They're also gonna they're gonna be directing the new Pet Cemetery yes. film. What was working with each of them? Oh, they're great. Um, they have very different energy. Um, Dennis is very always very energized and very quick about everything, and he talks very quickly. And you have to like really concentrate to follow what he's saying, you know. And Kevin is more laid back and quieter and slower and a little bit more behind the scenes. But um, they know each other so well that they're able to divide up the directing duties between themselves so effectively that everything just works about what they bring to the set, you know? Um, I would work with them at the drop of a hat on any project that they ever wanted me on. You know, I'm friends with them to this day, you know, chat on Facebook or whenever I see them out or whatever, you know. I just like maintaining contact, especially with good and really, really talented people like them. So, yeah, they're awesome. And I cannot wait to see Pet Cemetery. Oh, my gosh. I saw the new trailer yesterday. And I hear it's premiering at uh, South by Southwest, which is very exciting. Yeah, that trail does look good. Yes. In fact, it sold me on seeing this mm-hmm. film. Because I didn't even know that they directed it until I did research for this. Oh, movie. wow. Okay. Yeah, it was all over my time, um, my, my news feed on Facebook about, what, six, seven months back when they were actually up in Canada shooting it. So I knew, um, you know, a long time ago already that they were going to direct it. Now, speaking of other people being a part of big horror projects, what was it like working with the film's lead actress, Alex Essos? Yes, Alex Esso. Um, Alex is sweet as anything. Oh, my goodness. And she is just so talented. I know they had um, a lot of auditions to find um, the character, to find someone to play Sarah. Um, And she just nailed it. And she was so professional and calm and dedicated and everything on set. And they put her through the ringer, I promise you. You know, it was a physically demanding role. There's a lot of body horror in it, which means there's a lot of, you know, um, prosthetics and special effects makeup and things like that. Um, but she just handled everything like a pro, and now she's on to doing such big, such amazing things. It's really, really wonderful to see that. I'm so glad for her. Like Dr. Sleep. Yes, like Dr. Sleep. Exactly. Yeah, she's playing Wendy mm-hmm. Corrin. In the film. That's just brilliant. Now, what was the most challenging scene that you worked on in Starry, in Starry Eyes? Um, <clears throat> it was challenging for me because um, they had my character wear these sort of high heel shoes, and um, because my ankles are not that strong, I don't really usually wear high heel shoes. And one night when we were shooting at. Um, the producer's house. <coughs> Dennis was like, okay, we'll just quickly do another scene where I want you and Alex to be walking down this really long corridor and we want to hear your heels going click, 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 click on the st- Oh, dear God, this sounds terrifying. Um, and we did that scene again and again and again and the stones we were walking on were uneven. There was some crazy paving stone things. And... 
it was just really difficult for me to maintain my balance in the heels and on these stones. And I couldn't look down to see where I was walking because I was talking with Alex. Um, I came very close to calling cut on a scene, on that scene, actually, which is like one of the things you must never do. But I was convinced I was going to like fall on my face any second and that wouldn't have helped anyone. So it's to me, it's always something like that, something small like that, that other people can do without even thinking about it. And all these huge emotional scenes that I get to do, I'm like, well, I can do that without thinking about it. Whereas other people would be like, oh, that could be a challenge. So it's, I find that, that amusing, actually. Speaking of casting, directing, I also noticed that you've done some yourself. Now tell people... What is the description of a casting director? Okay, a casting director will be the one who will choose which actors to call in to audition for a role. Okay, they're like the gatekeeper between the actor and the director or producer. Um, they will choose who they want to see for the role, and then sometimes they will run the auditions themselves, or they will just let the actors audition for the director or producer, whoever wants to run the audition session. Um, usually, 99% of the time, they do not have the final decision in who gets cast in a role. Sometimes they will be asked for input, but it's usually completely up to the director or producer as to who gets cast. But a casting director will initially choose the group of what, 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever, actors to bring in for a specific role. Now, what made you want to work in that aspect of business? Well, I, I love casting, actually. Um, it, it came out of something like me reading a breakdown, seeing that a particular role is being cast, and my head going, oh, I know an actor who would be perfect for that, you know? And then when I was in films and they would be looking for someone to fill a certain role and they'd say, oh, we're having so much trouble to find this role. And I would be like, wait, I know five people who could do that perfectly. Let me tell you the names. And they would bring them in and one of them would book it. And from that, it just grew to, okay, um, I... I can actually cast. I love reviewing submissions. I can see instantly if an actor has potential or not, or if they're going to be good in the role that we're casting or not. And so I started, um, when I was co-producing films, I used to take on the role of casting director and actually post the breakdowns and go through the submissions and hold the auditions myself and then just get all the audition tapes, etc., off to production and then assist them with their decisions. It would never be my decision as to who to cast, but to assist production with the, with the decision. And it's just really grew from that. Um, I don't have time to produce anymore, but now I run a quite popular casting group on Facebook where I share the breakdowns I find on Facebook all over the country with um, actors who are also situated all over the country, just giving people more opportunity to find work. I find that very, very satisfying actually. Now, you mentioned you produce films. Yes. Now, what are some of the films that people can find online uh, that you produce? Um, there's a couple of horror movies and a couple in other genres as well. There is Consumption, um, which was written, directed by... Um, oh, why am I blanking? Brandon... Ah, I was speaking to him this morning on Instagram. Anyway, um, it used to be known as Live in Fear, and it is now Consumption. It was released through Wild Eye Releasing, and it should be out there totally for anyone to see. And there's also Way Down in Chinatown, which I believe is available through Amazon. There's also Far Away, which is a fantasy adventure film, um, which was shot in the Philippines, and I helped co-produce that, Randall Camrat was the writer, director, other producer on that one. Um, and yes, I did a short film of my own called, um, oh gosh, I'm breaking a lot of things today. Duh. I adapted a script from a writer called Graham Parker. 
and we shot that in the course of two days, I believe, here in Los Angeles. And I have copies of that. It's, I believe, it's uh, online on Chiller Chiller Channel. Um, and yeah, several other films as well that I was also a part of and that are either in post-production or out there like um, uh, Reunion and um, Something Sinister as well. There was a short film and a feature for Something Sinister, which is up on Vimeo, actually. So yeah, um, I did quite a lot of work and got a lot of it is out there, which is, I find, very exciting. Now, another film that people should check you out in is Trophy Heads. Tell everyone how you became a part of that film, as I really think it's a very underrated film. Yes. First of all, um, I just want to mention uh, it's Brandon Scullion, who was the writer, producer, director on Consumption. My brain just, just yeah, switched off for a second there. Trophy Heads, um, I saw the auditions on Actress Access, which is an online casting site. I submitted for it. I got called in, did a first round of auditions, even though I wasn't the physical type they were looking for. Um, The next day after my audition, I saw it was up on the casting site again, and I was like, well, I didn't book that one. (laughs) And then a couple days later, I got a call back for the role and I'm like, oh, well, maybe there's still a chance because I love the script and I love the character. And I went back for the call back, auditioned again for Charles, um, who I did not know at the time. And then I was driving somewhere on my way from the audition when I got the phone call from them to say, would you like the role? And I'm like, oh, absolutely. I would love the role. So that's how I became a part of Trophy Heads, and that was such a delightful shoot. I had such fun. The character is amazing. It's this kind of mixture between creepy and and, and funny that I really like. And depending on what Charles wanted for a specific scene, I could skew my performance creepy or I could skew it funny um, because I actually love horror comedy. I love playing horror comedy. it was just the best time. I, I adore Charles. I really do. Um, Adam Noble, who played my son, was as sweet as anything. And it was just great to like meet all the screen queens as well. Linnea and Michelle and Jackie and Brink. It was just like <laughs> the best time ever. And I really, really wish we could do a sequel to that. Anybody out there listening? Let's do a Trophy Head sequel. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of clamoring for one, too. Yeah. Because after the way the first film ended, it would be nice to at least go to at least the 90s. Mm-hmm. You know, like Megan Ward, uh, Cheryl Flynn, Charlie Spaulding, to name a few. Yeah, I mean, they're... Which I would yeah, think, go ahead, sorry. Which I would think would make a great mm. sequel. There are plenty of Scream Queens that we haven't killed yet, so yes. Now, what was it like to, working alongside each of the Scream Queens on that film? It was really fun. Um, I didn't... It wasn't like an incredibly long shoot, so uh, we probably got one day with each of them. Darcy was a darling. I mean, we spoke about her travels in Africa... And I'm from Africa, so that was a really cool bonding point, you know. Um, Linnea, oh my gosh, she's so cute. Um, I didn't tell her this, but I nearly dropped her when we were doing the kidnapping scene. We had to do it over and over again to get it exactly right. And every time, uh, Adam and I sort of had to lift her up into the van. And by doing it about six or seven times, I was like, well, yes, I'm getting a bit tired now. So the last time, I almost dropped her, and that wouldn't have been a good thing. <laughs> but she was, no. yeah, she was so sweet. I mean, yeah, it was just an all-around wonderful experience, wonderful production. Now, what was your favorite scene that you shot in the film? In Trophy Heads? Yes. Um, I think the one outdoors where... Um, Adam is hunting someone with a bow and arrow, I think it is. Um, The way it was written was I'm supposed to be there in this huge big coat um, carrying this, like, 
like um, see-through plexiglass shield or something. We didn't have the shield, but I was there outdoors doing my thing, and it was just a lot of fun. The role was fun, you know. Um, we gave her a couple of, like, quirks. She always wore cat socks. So if you ever look at my performance that closely, I'll be wearing a different pair of cat socks in every scene. And all of the knitting items that I wear in trophy heads, I actually made myself. My scarves and my um, my sweaters, I made them myself, so they're mine. Um, so I just found that the little perks we gave her was so cool and so interesting. But yes, I, I love the one outdoors. Now you get to work with Charles Spann again on the Ravenwood Towers. Yes. What was it like working on that? film. Ravenwood is also very cool. Uh, my character was very different to Trophy Heads, although I also played a mother and my offspring were a little bit weird to say the least. Um, but she was a little bit more serious, more powerful, um, more sane, shall we say, even though she wasn't completely sane. No. Um, again, it was fun. I love working with Charles, whatever project we're doing. I also work with them on um, Killjoy Psycho Circus. And it was awesome. I mean, I just love Charles. He's so old worldly and such a gentleman and so kind. You know, it's just, I mean, when we were walking back to set one night after working on um, Joyce's scene on Trophy Heads, he sort of took my arm and we strolled down this little hill in the moonlight just talking about things and so sweet, you know. And you don't generally find that a lot. He's awesome. Now, one of your more recent films is She Burns in Hell, which is a fan film to Sin King's Carry. How did you become involved in that project? Well, I, I've known Ryan Stacy from Concept Media for years. We've been friends online, and we chat on and off about different projects. And I'm actually attached to one of his upcoming features. Um... And he just messaged me one day, and he was like, so, how would you like to be the voice of Margaret White in this short Carrie film that I'm doing? And I'm like, oh my god, that's a dream role for me. I would love to do that. You know? Um, I, that seriously has been one of my dream roles forever. And when he asked me that, I was just all over it in a second. And he sent me the dialogue that he wanted me to record. And I did something as simple as recording it on my phone and emailing the recordings to him. And that was that. The next thing I knew, the film was out and everyone was saying how awesome it was. And I think it was great, too. Um, and, hey, I'm down as one of the market whites. So <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> now, what was it like phoning your performance in compared to giving a performance on set? You know, um, the voiceovers are always different. Um, there's, there's obviously less physicality because you're not doing all the actions. You're also not engaging with a scene partner. Um, so there's no one to really bounce your work off of or interact with. Um, so it's just you by yourself with your own interpretation of what you think the character is doing or meaning when they're saying whatever it is they're saying um it's usually quicker obviously um i've recorded narration for an entire film for instance um in like an hour in my study at home with the director there so it it doesn't take as long um but it is what's the word lonely almost you're not really a part of production if you just sit somewhere remotely and record your lines and email them off you know, I do prefer being on set, but hey, if voiceover is the only way I'm going to be in a project, I'll take that too. I do not mind. Now, what was it like working with Ryan Stacy in concept media films? Ryan is the cutest, sweetest thing ever. I know I say that about everyone, it seems like, but I think I'm just blessed to work with a whole bunch of wonderful people. Um, recently, we spoke on the phone um, for the very first time. We've been like, messaging each other forever and that was amazing um 
just so talented. Um, this new script that he has written, um, I have the whole thing to read, and I will be reading it this weekend, but I've read like the first 20 pages, and it's a period piece, and he just encapsulates the period like so amazingly well. I was actually shocked at how well he got the feeling of the period over that the, that the story is playing out in. So I cannot wait to go down there and shoot it with him and just, just like, connect with him in person. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you had to choose which aspect of the business that you like more, which would it be? Definitely acting. Um, that is the one that I cannot live without. Um, I've tried, and it's I get very depressed and very upset, very disturbed. You know, I can live without producing. I think anyone can live without producing if they have to. Um, I can live without directing, even though I adore directing for stage. I haven't yet for film. I love writing, but that's the thing that takes the longest and also has the least return. So I can live without that. Casting is very close to my heart, and I love making other people happy by giving them roles, but I can live without that. Acting is the one that, if I don't act, it really seriously affects my state of mind and it makes me just not content with my life it's it's a strange thing to explain but that is the one that I cannot live without now before I go I cannot help but ask about you, uh, a couple of questions about an upcoming film with sure. us I spit on your grave, Deja Vu. Yes. I won't go into much about this because of le legalities and yes. everything. But how do you come upon this project? I saw the breakdown for I Spit on Your Grave, Deja Vu on a casting website called Backstage.com um, in 2014, actually. Um, I read the breakdowns of the characters. I saw this one role and I was like, I can totally do that. So I submitted myself. A month or so later, I got invited to audition. It was not an in-person audition. Um, they sent me the sides, and I put myself on tape, and I submitted my, my tape to them and waited for almost a year. Um, and I thought, well, okay, that's it, obviously. I didn't get anywhere with that. And then they called me like almost a year later to come in for a callback and I was like oh this is exciting I have a chance um, I went in for the callback too if I remember correctly um, I met Jamie who was at that time reading for Christy Hills um, Camille Keaton's daughter character and I was overjoyed to see Jamie because I knew Jamie. I'd worked with Jamie. And it's so much better acting and working with someone that you know and you trust, you know. And they did not make a decision as to who was cast then. And Terry Zorki, he's one of the producers, Mary Zorki's son, kept on checking in with me every month or so. He would phone me, he would give me an update of where they were with the production, but I still wasn't cast. So I'm like thinking, Terry, this is lovely and I'm very interested, but why are you telling me this if I'm not cast? Do you want to cast me? If so, please tell me, because this is very exciting. Um, so this went on for a couple months until finally they were like, okay, we're almost at a position where we can start shooting now do you want the role? And um, I had also been up for some of the other roles in the film. I had read for, I think, one or two other roles. But my heart was set on the role of Becky. Um, and so I was like, Terry, which role do you mean? And then he was like, Becky. And I'm like, yes, yes, I'm so there. I am so there. Because the role was absolutely wonderful. Um, extremely complex, extremely emotional. Um, and confusing, as in the the um, 
reaction I hope to get from people when they watch it is, oh my god, she's doing god-awful things, but if I was in her position, maybe I would do them too. Does it make me a bad person? Oh my god, am I a bad person? So I want to get that kind of response in people when they watch me. So that whole aspect to me as a performer was very interesting. Um, and he said yes, and I was like, I'm down. And then it was a couple of months later, and we finally started shooting in, I think it was October of 2015. Yes. We shot for about a month. Were you surprised it took so long to get this role? Um, a little bit, yes, because it took longer than I was used to. But there is no agreed-upon standard amount of time for films to cast in you know many many things have to be aligned perfectly before people are ready to shoot you know and sometimes a piece of the puzzle that you thought you had in place falls out of place at the last possible second and you're going to shoot on Tuesday but hey now we can't shoot for six months or whatever you know um, and it's just I think I find it best not to anticipate things, not to set your hopes on things because, you know, I try out for so many projects that if I set my hope on every single project that I try out for, I would drive myself insane. That doesn't mean to say I don't try my best with every role I audition for. It just means that I don't, once I'm out of that audition room or I've taped my audition tape, I'm done with that. I'm on to the next. You know? I don't sit and wait to yes. hear from someone. I don't sit by the phone. I just get on with my life. Now, were you a fan of the original? Film? Yes, I was. I had heard about it forever, and I had always wanted to see it and see what the fuss was about. And then one night, I found it was available on Netflix. And yeah, when they... Was it Netflix or was it Amazon? No, I think it was Netflix. So I watched it. And I was blown away by what they did with it. You know, um, the realism that was shown in that film is, 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 is disturbing. Um, that iconic last image of Camille in that boat with that little smile on her face. I don't think I will ever forget that. You know? Yeah, that's a... Yeah, it's like... It's one of the most shocking films I've ever yeah. seen. Between that... Fault Cheese, The New York Ripper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a... Those two are in pieces. Ah. Uh, are pretty much some of the most shocking films I've seen. Wow. But I would definitely recommend... I Spit on Your Grave. Because it's... It's... It's not for the get hot, but yes. it can be really shocking film. Yes, yes it can. And I hope that, um, yeah. sorry. No, no, go right ahead. I was going to say, I hope that Deja Vu will give, give a fitting second installment in the story. Yes. Now, do you know when the film's going to come out? Um, I have been, I have not been given a date by Terry Zarki yet, but I have heard that it could be as soon as the next couple months. Now, what are some of your other projects coming? Well, um, a film I have a small role in, Painkillers, directed by Roxy Shi, actually came out on February 4th. So that's currently on all the VOD sites, etc. So take a look at that one. That sort of like rewrites the vampire genre and it's gotten really good reviews so far. Um, an anthology horror that I was in called um, All the Creatures Were Stirring came out last month. And um, Krampus Origins came out in November. Um, so I've had a really good run over the last couple of months of films coming out. And I have maybe three or four more that will be coming out during the course of um, this year, 2019. And at the moment, if everything goes as planned, um, I'm probably shooting at least another 10 this year. But, you know, who knows what will ultimately happen. But that's the plan right now. 
Now, where can people find you on social media? Um, my Instagram account, which is Maria Olson six six. Um, I post daily, and I'm also on Twitter, also Maria Olson six six. And I also post on my Facebook fan page, which is Maria Olson fan page. Um, you should recognize me because I've got like the same banner picture or whatever up on my different sites. Um, and I post regularly and I interact with everyone who like messages me or comments or anything like that. Um, I'm very responsive on social media. Um, and if you're an actor and you're listening to this, please join my casting group, Facebook. It's called The Monster Shares Auditions. Um, I love my little monsters and I love when they book projects and I help them do that. Now, I want to thank you for coming on the show, Maria. You are so welcome, and thank you for having me, Anthony. No, no problem. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you. You too. All right. Besides Anthony T's Horror Show, you can also listen to these other fine podcasts on the Doc Discussions Network. Doc Discussions, hosted by Phil Perone and Michael Darwin. You Know Nothing, Jon Snow, a Game of Thrones podcast. Bullets, Brothels, and Bots, a Westworld podcast. Halloween Boutique, Psychotronic Reviews. And Searching for American Gods. You can find Doc Discussions on the web at www.docdiscussions.com. And Doc Discussions is also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. I want to thank Maria also for coming on to the show. I would definitely recommend you check out her film Stary Eyes and Trophy Heads. They're both available on DVD and Blu-ray. And also... Her most recent short film, She Burns in Hell, a Carrie fan film, which can be found on Concept Media's YouTube channel. And also check out Concept Media's other stuff, as they have both Don't Fuck in the Woods and Betsy available on VOD. Got some upcoming releases, including... Angel on DVD and Blu-ray, which you can get on their official website. And Don't Fuck in the Woods 2, which is the sequel to the film that put the company on the map. You can visit their official website at conceptmediallc.com for more information. Now here's my review of Happy Death Day to You. Well, yours truly got a chance to see Happy Death Day to You this opening weekend for the film. And it's a sequel to the 2017 hit Happy Death Day. Now you're saying to yourself, how could they make a sequel to Happy Death Day? Now you're wondering why they made a sequel to this film? Because... The 2017 film really made money at the box office as it made over $55 million. But that film was one of those films that looked like it didn't need a sequel, but it got one. Going into the sequel, one of the things I was very fearful for was the fact that it might feel like the same movie as the first one let's face it it's a premise that really does not lend itself to sequels but still i decided to check it out anyway since i have a showcase subscribe pass so this was at least worth the risk of checking out if it wasn't that good then oh well at least you're buying a subscription service, so it wouldn't be too much of a loss. But there were some good things with this film. One of the things I liked about this film was that it explains why it happened. Because 
in the first film, you don't know why she's reliving the day over and over again. But, at least this film answers this pretty much right away, which is good. Because if you're going to do a sequel to this, you might as well answer that question. Because... You were kind of left in the dark to why the main character in the film was reliving the day over and over again in the first film. So I'm glad they answered that question in that film as to why she keeps reliving the same day over and over. And I also like the fact that this film at least takes the same story and does like an alternate version of the same day because it really does a good job in giving more development into the main character of the first two films as it just expands her story and her background which is a good thing because if this film was just happy death day all over again this film would have sucked big time because why would you pay for a film and just see the same movie over again? Now, the downside to this film was if I like the same movie all over again. But the way they overcome this floor is to pretty much give like an alternate version of the day and the characters from the first film as it really makes it watchable at least. Happy Death Day to you is a good film. Would I say if it's better than the original? Mm, slightly better. Because I like the fact that there's more character development with the main character here. Plus the fact you get a reason to why this main character keeps reliving the same day over and over again. And it pretty much explores... Other things that you wouldn't see in a horror film. So I'm going to give Happy Death Day 3 stars out of 5. Would I buy it? Yes, probably. Because since I enjoyed it, I had a good time. I don't know if I can recommend the film. Because, let's face it, it's a good popcorn movie. But I don't know if you're going to remember this film 5 or 10 years down the line. Want to find out the latest guest announcements and news regarding Anthony T's Horror Show? You can follow Anthony T's Horror Show on these social media platforms. Facebook at www.facebook.com slash Anthony T's Horror Show. On Twitter at www.twitter dot com slash Anthony T's Horror and Instagram at www.instagram.com slash Anthony T's Horror Show. For my film recommendation, this episode is an anthology horror film called House of the Dead. Now this film was released in 1978 and it had no numerous titles including Last Stop on 13th Street, Zone of the Dead, and Alien Zone, which does not make sense with this film. Thankfully they did not use Alien Zone here. But back to the film. The film is directed by Sharon Miller, who pretty much was a TV director back in the 70s. She had a career that spanned from 1971 to 2002. She basically just did television as House of the Dead is her only feature film. But this is a really good film. It may start off a little slow, but... This is one of those anthology films that picks up as the film goes along. I thought the stories were very good. 
I like the fact that this had a creepy feel to it. If I had to choose my favorite segment of the film, I'd have to say probably the third one with the detectives. Because that was pretty much my favorite out of the four short films in the anthology. This film also has a good wraparound segment as well. Which really gets you interested into these stories. It's definitely a good film to check out. Just sad that Sharon Mill only did one feature film. Because House of the Dead is a really good film. House of the Dead is currently available on DVD and Blu-ray from Vinegar Syndrome. I suggest you buy it. It's, it's very good. If you're a fan of anthology horror, then this is one anthology horror film you should check out. On the Anthony T's Horror Show YouTube page, I recently rebranded the Horror Chambers DVD and Blu-ray collection. The new name is Anthony T's Horror Collection. So, besides Blu-rays, I'll showcase some of the autographs I've gotten over the years, Funkos, and anything horror related. I figured I'd make a video. That includes everything instead of just DVDs and Blu-rays all the time. So, each episode's been rebranded as Anthony T's Horror Collection. Check that out on my YouTube page. Just search Anthony T's Horror Show. And please subscribe to the channel. As I really would love to get 100 subscribers. Because if I can get 100 subscribers, I can actually have a custom URL name which would be very beneficial to my YouTube channel page since right now I'm just running it off of my personal YouTube account please subscribe but definitely search Anthony T's Horror Show on YouTube that's the easiest way you can find my channel and with that I want to thank you for listening have a good day and support indie horror